put us in your shoes a little bit of what it's like to live in a place where, uh, where faith is costly. About two or three weeks ago, uh, one disciple of ours was uh, actually put on trial for becoming a Christian and was sentenced to hanging. Uh, the normal experience for uh, believers is to be kidnapped, uh, beaten, tortured, uh, in attempt to make them recant their new faith. I'm, I'm curious uh, what that does for your faith. It has taught me in a very real way that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And I think God is doing some really big things right now around us, uh, not because it's we have some great strategy. In fact, we never intended to go start a school. Uh, we get to be on the front row seat to see what God is doing. Give us some, some stories of where God has shown up. One lady we call Tessain uh, had a dream uh, in the night of Jesus and woke up that next morning and said, I want to follow Jesus. And never had a missionary, never had a Bible. This was, she just knew the dream. Was that unique or is that, do you hear that more than once? Oh, more than once, across the Arab world. This is a normal way uh, that people are coming to faith. Meeting Jesus in a dream. Yes. Wow, wow. Those that have been coming to Chapel Street for a while know this is a, a, an Advent tradition that we have of supporting different global workers doing various things. And we've heard that the goal of, of 500,000 mm -hmm. will go towards this Hope School. Talk about the impact. If we were to meet that goal, talk about the impact you think it would have for the school, for the community, for the city, just kind of tell us what you think could happen were all of this to, to take place. Yeah, very simply, uh, we have an 86,000 square foot facility that's brand new, but the insides are not finished. So we're using about 20% of the square footage that has been outfitted as classrooms. We are maxed out with 200 students, uh, but we have a plan that we could have 1,500 students. Wow. And so that amount would be able to help us outfit the entire building uh, in order to go from 200 to 1,500 students. This sounds like it would just be a game changer in that community, would it's it a not? It's a total game changer. Yeah. And it's nothing like it in, uh, we're in a city of millions of people. Yeah. There's nothing like it. In fact, really over the past decade, uh, due to conflict in the country, there has not been a full year of education. Is there anything else you, you wish our church to know? Any last words you wanna leave us with? Yeah, just to be uh, very clear, you know, we've talked about how Chapel Streeters can get involved. Uh, obviously the first one is uh, financially. And I would just encourage, I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> this is an opportunity to stretch your faith. I remember when Carrie and I first decided we're gonna go. We left our house uh, for a weekend and we actually had people that do estate sales come in and like put price tags on all the things we owned. And uh, we came back, we approved the prices, left another weekend and then it was just all gone. And, and something that we have learned in doing this is as we take sacrificial steps of faith, uh, our faith grows and we see God showing up in huge ways. And so as Chapel Streeters are thinking about how can they partner with us, uh, we have never gone wrong by taking faith steps, uh, sacrificial faith steps, and then seeing how God shows up. Well, we've been uh, telling you the story of Doug and Carrie over the last several weeks. God called them from our community, from this part of the world, to go and serve him in a war-torn country in Africa. They weren't planning to plant a school, as you heard, but God uh, had other plans, as he often does in our lives. Perhaps you can relate to that. Things that you didn't expect you'd be doing, God has plans for you to be doing. And they were given this facility, 80,000 square feet, by a Muslim man who just wanted to, because he saw that what they were bringing to the community. And I just want you to, if you, if you missed it, I want you to think about that for a minute the chance to help bring trauma-informed and gospel-infused education to 1,500 children in this part of the world is a game changer. It will change a generation. It will, by God's grace, change a nation. And you, though you may never go there, have a chance to be part of that.
I said uh, a couple weeks ago, you may never meet them, but that's actually not true. You could meet Doug today. He's actually here. Doug, would you stand? Just want you to see Doug. And, and yeah. And thank you. You can stick around afterwards, right down front, if you'd like to say hello to him, pray for him, encourage him. Hello, he'd love to meet you as well. His uh, wife and children will be joining him for the Christmas season here in the States before they head back. So once again, if, uh, if you're new here, if you're a guest here, don't feel any obligation or pressure to give. This is just what we do at the Advent season. We tell a story of what God's doing somewhere around the world so that you can pray for them, have your, your vision expanded for what God's doing, and if God should move in your heart, to give toward that. You can do that simply by putting Serve the World in your check or, or your online donation, and that all the money raised in the month of December, including our Christmas Eve service offerings, will go to support God's work uh, through Doug and Carrie in that part of the world. So we just want to say thank you again for your generosity to our regular ongoing efforts and to what he's doing around the world. It's making a difference. You may not think it. You may think, what does my little contribution do? But God multiplies our efforts and blesses people all around the world. We get to be part of that. So thank you again. We're going to continue in our series uh, called The Spirit of Christmas, not to be confused with the Christmas spirit, which is wonderful and all of that, but the spirit of Christmas is different. It's the Holy Spirit moving is the unseen hero, the unsung mover force behind what's happening in the Advent story, God by his spirit uh, moving from the Old Testament into the New. And we're going to begin by reading a passage that is very familiar to you, but I often read the passage. And sometimes my familiar voice in the, in the familiar passage can cause us not to hear it in a new and fresh way. So I've asked Ariel Benjamin to come and read this passage for us. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word from Luke chapter 1. Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed, to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the Lord of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son in the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You may be seated. Thank you, Ariel, for reading that for us, that passage of God's word as we come to it now. And I think it's appropriate that Ariel read and that Jenny Allen uh, welcomed us all. You might not know this. Well, you probably could tell. Jenny is uh, due and expecting their first child tomorrow. She's being induced tomorrow. So <laughs> praise God for that. We'll be praying for you. Can you believe it? Jenny and Peyton, you're going to be parents tomorrow. <laughs> Amazing. Let us pray. God, we worship you and thank you for the power and beauty and glory of your word. We confess that sometimes we ignore it. it, it passes right by us, and so open our minds and hearts to hear it in a fresh way as we unpack it. Thank you for the gift of life, new life. We pray for the, the Allen's baby, for the babies and children among us, even downstairs being taught now, and for the new life you give us through your son Jesus, which we celebrate this Advent season. We pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, as I said, it's a familiar passage to all of you. You know, we read that at, at, at the Advent season. The story of the angel Gabriel coming and announcing to Mary that she's going to have a baby. Uh, and I think part of the challenge for us is we have these notions about what the story's like. We sentimentalize it and sanitize it in our minds, don't we? It's, it's familiar to us. We sing about it. There's the manger scenes. And I just think we, we struggle to hear it in a fresh way. Mary um, was a teenage girl. And in the middle of the nowhere, part of Roman province, 
like a, a girl, a poor teenage peasant girl from nowhere. And I don't think also, that what, what, she, what also doesn't help us is the way Mary's portrayed in art and in the stories that we watch and see and what's in our mind's eye, our, our imagination. Sometimes it's like this in medieval Renaissance art. You see pictures like this. Mary wearing her blue robe, classic blue robe, symbol of royalty and of heaven, reading her bound Bible, which didn't exist at that time, sitting in a courtyard with a halo and Gabriel looking rather, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I don't want to bother you, Mary. <laughs> like, you know, let me give the announcement. It's just interesting. Or, or this image, a more contemporary image of Mary, like in her blue jumper and saddle shoes. I, I, you know, it looks like it's like a house in maybe, I don't know, Orlando or something. But this image here by the artist uh, Henry Osawa Tanner, 1898. I really love this painting. Saw it years ago. Gabriel's depicted with a, as, a, as a vertical beam of light. It's hard to see perhaps for you, but if you could Google this image, uh, it, her eyes, her facial expression, there's an intelligence, a humility, a curiosity in her face. No halo, no Bible. Notice also the blue robe to the side, a symbol of her, 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 uh, the divine mantle she will take up. She hasn't taken it yet hearing this announcement. Now, some of you may have grown up in a tradition where you prayed a prayer to Mary. You grew up saying this, where Mary was revered almost uh, to the level of being divine, co-redemptress. This is not what the Bible teaches. But others of us have grown up in the Protestant evangelical tradition where we've so diminished and reduced Mary that we totally missed what an amazing person this is and how much God has to teach us through her faith and her response. So may we all have fresh eyes to see Mary and hear this story and see Christ through this story. First thing we'll draw your attention to in the story is a strange and wonderful greeting. It's easy to pass over that. A strange and wonderful greeting. Last week, we saw Pastor Brian talk to us about Gabriel, the same angel appearing to Zechariah. Remember this? Gabriel sent to Zechariah the priest to announce to him that his wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a baby, and it's going to be John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way. And Zechariah wasn't exactly uh, quick to believe. Gabriel's role is not done yet. He's sent again as a messenger. We, we know there's lots of angels in scriptures. We only know two of their names, Michael and Gabriel. If you get an angel from God, that's a pretty big day. If you get Gabriel, that's a good day. He's sent to a small backwater village in Galilee called Nazareth. You might remember in the gospel accounts when, they're, when it's announced that Jesus is from Nazareth. You hear the, the response, can anything good come from Nazareth? It's 15 miles from the Sea of Galilee, no fresh water source. It's a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. And this is a teenage peasant girl from a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. Let's look at verses 26 through 28 of the story once more. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Think about that. An angel, one of the two named angels, Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God Almighty, comes to this peasant teenage girl and says, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. And we're told that Mary's betrothed. It doesn't just mean engaged. It's, not, it's, it's a bit different. The Jewish system of, of, uh, of marriage had three sort of components in succession. There was the engagement, the betrothal, and then the wedding itself for the marriage consummation. So it's more serious, more formal, more significant than the engagement. She's betrothed. She's awaiting her groom's arrival to come. He's preparing a place for her. He's going to come and announce that the time has come and take her for a week-long wedding ceremony. To get out of the betrothal, you need a legal document. You're almost married, in other words. 
And he comes to her, this young teenage girl. And by the way, she's among the most vulnerable people in that society. To be young, female, poor, unwed, puts you in a very vulnerable position in that world. And this is who God chooses to come to her. Her name, by the way, Mary means beloved. So he greets her with a deeper meaning of her own name. Gabriel greets this girl according to the deeper meaning of her name, her true identity in the eyes of God. And the greeting itself is amazing. He says, favored one. Your Bible translation might say highly favored. You who have found favor with God, he'll say later in verse 30. Favor, uh, the Greek root word is charis. We translate that grace, unmerited favor, undeserved favor. God is favoring her. Why? Because she's so special? She will become that. But he didn't look across the face of the earth and pick the most deserving human being he could find. Because this is who God is. He pours out his undeserved favor on us. Maybe you grew up saying the prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace. She is full of grace. It's true. But the grace she's full of is a grace that is given to her by God. It's a grace that is received, not a grace that she dispenses. Only God does that. A grace that has been given to her from God, from on high. Which is why she wonders about it. What kind of greeting is this? And we're told that Gabriel says to her, not only you're favored, but God is with you. We know from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, this is the central promise, right? Emmanuel. A virgin will be with child, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You could make the case, and it's a strong case, that the entire story of the Bible is the story of Emmanuel, God desiring to be with his people. But we just can't seem to get our act together enough to receive that. We run from that. We reject that. We'd rather go our own way. And God comes to her and says, the Lord is with you, Mary. What's Mary's response to this greeting? We're gonna come back to that in a minute, but initially it is she's, she's deeply troubled or distressed. What does this mean? Why me? It's unsettling to her. What could Yahweh possibly want with her? Notice what Gabriel says next. Mary hasn't said a word yet. She's just praying and thinking and pondering and questioning and wondering. Gabriel responds with a life-changing announcement. He goes right on into what the... Re he didn't just come to give her a greeting. He came to proclaim something. That's what angels do. They're heralds. They, they have something to declare from God. Look at verses 30 through 33 in this life-changing announcement. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. There it is again, favor. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This message, this, uh, this life-changing announcement is gonna change Mary's life, no, no doubt and the entire world, yours and mine and all of human history. The first words that Gabriel says is, do not be afraid, Mary. This is very common when angels show up. We think of angels like, like in the paintings, right? Hi. Or they're, they're chubby babies with wings floating around with harps and bow and arrow. That's Cupid, kind of, I don't know. Right? There, we think of them as like, they're, they're otherworldly, cute, nice. Angels are terrifying. Angels reflect the glory of the presence of God. And every time you see them in Scripture, people aren't going, sweet, an angel. What's up, angel? They're, they're, they're terrified. They're falling down, trembling as dead. Mary is troubled in her spirit. And the angel says, don't be afraid. Why not? Everyone else is. Because you have found favor with God. God sees you. God is pouring out his grace on you. God has plans for you. God is going to do something in you, through you, and in the world. What's that? You're going to have a son, question mark, right? You're going to have a son, and you'll name him Jesus. Now, many of you might know this, the name Jesus. 
is, uh, is that we, it's a transliteration of the Hebrew word Yeshua. Literally, what does the word, anybody know what does the word Yeshua, the name Yeshua mean? Salvation. God saves. Think about that. Whenever you read in the Old Testament, this, like when, when, in Psalm 51, when David prays, restore to me the joy of your salvation, that phrase, your salvation, is the same root for Yeshua. You're going to name your son salvation. Think about this for a minute. A peasant girl from the middle of nowhere, an angel appears. God sees you. God favors you. God's going to do something in you and through you. You're going to have a son, and you're going to call him salvation. God saves. We all have big plans for our kids as parents. You've got big plans for your kids? I'm naming my child salvation of the Lord. Right? All hail salvation, right? No. Every parent thinks their child is special, but this is something unique. Hey, virgin girl from nowhere, you're gonna have a baby and he will be the salvation of the Lord. And then he goes on, he will be great. We could unpack this in a, in a month of sermons, but I'll just go briefly. Great in his nature, he'll be sinless, he'll be div- the perfect God and perfect man. Two natures combined in one person, the God man. He'll be great in his mission and his purpose to do the will of the Father, to give himself as a ransom for the sins of the world. He'll be great in his mercy, great in his love, great in his glory, in every possible way he will be great. He'll be called Son of the Most High. He's not only your son, Mary, but he's God's unique son. And through him all people can be called sons and daughters of the Most High. He'll sit on the throne of his father, David. You might remember a few weeks ago, we had the stump up here. We talked about the branch from the stump of Jesse, Jesse, the father of David. He's coming as promised from Isaiah chapter nine from the line of David. He's gonna reign on his throne. God's gonna make good on his promise. In other words, he's saying this to a peasant girl. Your son is going to be the hopes and longings of all of your ancestors and your baby boy. And his kingdom will have no end. It's not a political or military throne. Not ultimately. This past week, in, I was in Oxford, England. I flew back actually last night. I don't have jet lag yet. I'm feeling pretty good. But this afternoon, I might crash. We'll see. Uh, and I attended uh, lectures uh, all week long at the Wycliffe Hall uh, on evangelism and mission. First couple of days were a, a, a scholar and theologian named N.T. Wright. And he lectured on the kingdom of God. I walked out of those every, uh, every six hours a day, just my heart almost bursting with this vision of what God intends to do. He's saying to this peasant girl, what I intend to do, I'm gonna do through your son. It's just mind-blowing. The rule and reign of Jesus is the kingdom of God. And we've said throughout this series that we live between the advents, the first coming of Jesus, which we're looking at here, and the second coming of Jesus, which will be very different in power and glory. And the kingdom is not waiting until the king returns. He has come and he will come again. And between those advents, we live with this anticipation and we work for his kingdom now, even though he will accomplish it fully when he returns. That's why we do things like shepherd's heart. See, Aaron's sitting over here. We're reaching people in their need Glimpses of the kingdom in our, in our ministry and our efforts. It's why we support ministries like Doug and Kerry in a far part of, of the world in Africa. The kingdom breaking in in a war-torn country in Africa. Wherever you find the rule and reign of Jesus, even a glimpse of it, that's the kingdom. Mary's being told the king is coming and it's gonna be her baby boy. You sing that song, right? The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes, joys, longing, expectations of all of God's people culminating in this child. How do you, desp- how do you respond to this news? This brings us to the, second, the third point, the response of awe and wonder. A response of awe and wonder. Last week, we, uh, Zechariah showed us how you don't talk to an angel. How not to talk to an angel? Look at the story of Zechariah, right? From earlier in Luke chapter one. Let's look at that just briefly here. Luke 1, 18 through 20. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife has advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I don't know if he said it that way. That's how I envision it. 
I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Now, doesn't Mary also question? Doesn't she also ask how? What's this? How do we make sense of this? Did, did Zechariah just get Gabriel on a kind of grumpy day? Like, oh, I don't want to go down there. Fine. Like he's just short-tempered? No, not at all. Zechariah is a priest, and he's being told by an angel who stands in the presence of God. Zechariah is meant to stand in the presence of God for the people. Now this angel who stands in the presence of God is telling him that God's going to do again what he has done in the past. Remember Abraham and Sarah. It's happened before. Of all people, Zechariah should know God can do this. He's done it before. Differently, the angel comes to Mary and says God's going to do something that has never happened before to a peasant virgin. It's not surprising that she would ask the question, how? But if you probe deeper, I think Zechariah is questioning God's ability. Mary is not. Mary is only asking, well, how does this work? How's this going to work? How are you going to do this? Look at her response in verse 29 and verse 34. Greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be in her heart, pondering. And by the way, this, this alone should give you some encouragement. If you've ever read the word of God, if you've ever felt God speak to you and, and been distressed, been troubled, wondered, what does this mean? How do I make sense of it? You're not alone. Mary is a model for that. And then in verse 34, after the announcement, she says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Like, listen, I, I'm not educated. I'm from a little nowhere town, but I know that virgins don't have babies. Well, sometimes I think we assume that people in the ancient world all had IQs of like 50 because they're, oh, well, they're credulous, they're superstitious, they just believe this stuff. No. She's wondering and pondering, how does this work? Full of awe and wonder and some questions. It's okay to ask questions in your faith. In fact, it's good that you ask questions in your faith. I think God invites it and wants it. It's okay to think deeply, even to be distressed and troubled at times. God's not put off by that. There's room with God for you to wrestle and question and ponder and be distressed. This is what God is doing. This brings us to the divine reassurance. Mary asked this question, and Gabriel responds differently than they did with Zechariah with a word of reassurance. Now, the Holy Spirit's been all over this story, moving in the background, moving in on hearts and minds, but here he comes to the foreground in Luke 1, 35 to 37. And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. So Mary says, how will this happen since I'm a virgin? And Gabriel says, the Spirit of God will come upon you. And Mary goes, totally clears it up. <laughs> All right. The Spirit is coming upon Mary and overshadowing her. This is echoing, by the way, the very first miracle in the Bible. These words, the Holy Spirit coming upon you, the power of, of the Spirit overshadowing you, what is this echoing? What's the first miracle in all the Bible? Creation itself. At the heart of our faith, right, we believe that God, who is the self-existent eternal one, created all that exists out of nothing. By a word of his power. And here's what Genesis 1, 1 and 2 tells us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Bible's first outlandish claim is that there is one God who created all that exists from nothing. So if that's true, then believing in a virgin birth is not irrational. In fact, believing that God could make the whole universe out of nothing, but not believing that God could not make a baby without a human father, that's irrational. It'd be like saying to an Olympic uh, speed skater, I know you're an Olympic speed skater, but I bet you can't do a figure eight. I'm like, what? Or, or, or a figure skater, I mean. Like, that make... If God can do that, he can do this. 
Australian-born author and evangelist Glenn Scrivener puts it this, uh, this way. Christians believe in the virgin birth. Atheists believe in the virgin birth of the universe. Pick your miracle. You choose your miracle. C.S. Lewis puts it this way um, in a book called The Grand Miracle. And Lewis, by the way, some people debate, I, I, I often debate this with some friends that are theologically minded. What's the grander miracle, the greater miracle? The incarnation, God taking on human flesh, or the resurrection, conquering death and sin in the grave? Lewis answers the question, and I'll just defer to him. Uh, that the, the incarnation is the grand miracle. God writing himself into our story. He argued that the one grand miracle of Christianity is not the crucifixion, the resurrection, but it is Christ's birth. And he saw every other miracle of Scripture as preparing for, demonstrating, or resulting from the incarnation. He writes this, The Christian story is precisely the story of one grand miracle. The Christian assertion being that what is beyond all space and time, what is uncreated, eternal, came into nature, into human nature, descended into his own universe, and rose again, bringing nature up with him. It is precisely one great and grand miracle. If you take that away, there is nothing specifically Christian left. If you're wondering why the virgin birth matters. If you take it away, there's nothing specifically Christian left, he writes. And we're all invited to follow this first follower called Mary, entrusting this miracle. Now, about that last line of Gabriel, for nothing is impossible with God, verse 37. Some of you uh, may have seen on Facebook, maybe you haven't, but a friend of mine named Damian McCrink, he was pastor of River City Church, moved uh, in, in, in St. Charles, moved his family uh, to Florida, then Georgia. Uh, his wife was diagnosed with uh, rare, advanced, aggressive brain cancer. She went from being healthy, the picture of health and, and vitality, to being immobilized and gone in a couple of weeks. It was stunning and horrific and just gutted for their family. Throughout Facebook, many of us who know and love them were praying, 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 praying for a miracle, praying for God's intervention. I've shared with you about Jenny Cater, my administrative assistant, asking all of you to pray, and many of you have, and God has appeared to put her cancer in remission and restore her to health. So we read this, nothing's impossible with God, and we see God not answering a prayer to heal one woman and another he does, and I don't have answers for that. It's tempting to try to apply this to like, maybe like the athlete writes on his shoe, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ, Christ who strengthens me and think this is some reference to get what we want, what we think God should do in our time. That's not what it's saying. But here's what it is saying that should be of great encouragement to us. Everything God promises to do, he can do. Everything God says that he's going to do in salvation history, he has the power to do. Nothing is beyond his power. And so we can and should cry out to him for mercy, but also acknowledging that he's God and we are not. So when Mary says how, the angel's saying, we're talking about God. He's told you. He will do it. I'm sure Mary still had questions. How could she have grasped all that was being said to her, all that would come through her son. But she knew enough to respond with complete surrender. Complete surrender. Mary's final response is itself a work of the Spirit in her mind and her heart. And I'm praying that it would be so in ours as well. Look how she responds. The last verse of our text this morning, verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, which means, look, 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 I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She doesn't get every nuance, every detail, every question answered there, but she gets enough to respond with total surrender. This, I mentioned this past week, I was in Oxford. I was walking with a friend, John Dixon, uh, who you've heard preach and will hear preach again. He was one of the lecturers there. We were, I think, on a morning walk, and I asked him about this, and he said, he reminded me, Mary is the first Christian. She's the first genuine Christian, meaning she's the first person in all the Bible to hear the good news of God's salvation in a man named Jesus and respond in faith. She has questions? Yes. She ponders it, is troubled by it? Yes. But ultimately, she surrenders 
And in that sense, Mary is an example to all of us. She's the model. She's the pattern for biblical faith. Ask your questions. Think deeply. Wrestle it out with God. And come to the place by the work of his spirit where you can say, look, I, I'm yours. May it be to me as you've said. I don't know what's gonna come. I don't understand how it's all gonna play out. By the way, Mary does this before knowing about how it's all exactly going to happen. We look back with certainty to the cross and the empty tomb, don't we? And we can take Mary as a pattern for us. I don't see how you're all gonna do all this, Lord, but I know that you're good. I know that you can do all that you say you will do, and so I'm yours. May it be to me, as you have said. In surrendering herself, Mary is signing up for some public ridicule, some scorn, some shame, some uncertainty. How will Joseph respond? She doesn't know yet. There's lots of unanswered questions, but she knows that God has spoken. She knows salvation is coming. So she says, I'm yours. I'm gonna read to you, well, Jennifer Powell McNutt, a professor at Wheaton College, who writes this about Mary's life. The entire Christian life, in a way, is mirrored by the experience of Mary. Each one of us, both male and female, are called to live in Christ and he in us. We are all expected to carry Christ at the core of our being like Mary carried Christ in her womb and to labor with him and for him. But unlike a human mother giving life to a human child, Christ gives us new life by his indwelling. Who better to reflect that truth to the Christian world than the one who literally bore Jesus on our behalf through the power of the Holy Spirit? Mary is for both men and women, all of us, invited to follow this first follower as she followed Christ. So finally, I want to remind you this series has been about the Spirit. And I want to give you two things to take away with you and then we'll worship together as we close. Uh, these are just refreshers from the story. The first, the unique greeting Mary receives from the angel points us to the blessing we can all receive from her son Jesus. She's unique. She's the only one like her in all of scripture. But what happens to her, the greeting she receives from the angel, highly favored. God is with you. You are blessed. That comes to everyone who trusts in Jesus, her son. God says to you, if you place your trust in Jesus Christ, I highly favor you, my beloved daughter and son. I'm with you always. And you're blessed. Second, Mary's response to the angel, as I said, is a model for all of us who would place our trust in God. Awe and wonder, honest questioning, humble surrender. What does it mean to become a Christian? Does it mean following a set of philosophical principles? Does it mean checking the box and voting a certain way? It means this, awe and wonder that the Lord Almighty entered into our story, lived a perfect sinless life, died in your place and in mine and rose from the grave and is coming again. Ponder that, wrestle with that, question that, and in the end, give your life to that. May it be to you and to me, to us, as he has said. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story. I, I know that I, I have just scratched the surface and am wholly inadequate to communicate the power of the story of Mary and to point to your glory through it. But I pray that your spirit is moving now because we're not just talking about your spirit moving long ago, doing something in the past, but moving in hearts and minds right now, moving in our hearts and minds right now. And I know there are people seated here, hearing this, who wrestle with questions. Holy Spirit, speak to them. Who have doubts. Holy Spirit, speak to them and are struggling to surrender. Holy Spirit, move in them. Help us all, like Mary, to say to you with joy, awe, and wonder, may it be to us of you as you have said. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus, our King. Amen. Let me close with this prayer, which is read by... Christians all over the world at Advent season. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came among us in great humility, that on the last day, 
when he comes again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.